Hello and welcome back to the conference. I would now like to introduce our first session of the day. It's regarding data linkage and knowledge sharing to deepen our understanding of child death. This session showcases projects where agencies have shared knowledge, information and linked data to support case analyses and improve understanding of the causes and risk factors in child deaths. Our first speakers for this session are Dr. Rebecca Shipstone from the QFCC and Dr. Uh, Dr. Paula Lister from the Children's Health Queensland, who will be presenting on the Paediatric Sepsis Project and the value of linked data and interprofessional partnerships. So I'll now pass over to Rebecca and Paula. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Good morning, everyone. Today, we would like to share Just with you- waiting for Beck to join us. I'm here. Can you not hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Sorry. Good morning. Today we would like to share with you some of our recent work around paediatric sepsis mortality. And in well, particular... presenting is, is Beck joining us? I am. I'm here. Yep. And in particular, this presentation will focus on the value of linked data and interagency partnerships in increasing both the identification and understanding of child deaths due to sepsis. So, as we said, this is a partnership project. We're not hearing her. Can everyone hear me? Yep. No. No. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? They have lost me, Dom, and they're saying they can't hear me. Sorry, we won't be long. Can you hear me? Some people can. Or would you like me to keep going, Dom? Sorry, I'm just not sure if you can hear, can hear you. me or not. I can hear you. You can hear me? I can. Awesome. Okay, I'll just keep going. Sorry about that, everyone. As I was saying, this is a partnership project between the Queensland Paediatric Sepsis Program at Children's Health Queensland and the Queensland Family and Child Commission. So while the people involved in this project go well beyond those online today, your presenters are Dr. Paula Lister and me, Beck Shipstone. Paula is the medical co-lead of the Queensland Paediatric Sepsis Program and the Director of Paediatric Intensive Care at the Sunshine Coast Hospital and Health Service. And I'm one of the Principal Research and Special Project Officers in QFCC's Child Death Prevention Team. Before we begin today, we would like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians across the land, seas and skies where we walk, live and work. We celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures across Queensland and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Today I am presenting from Brisbane, the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara peoples, and Paula is presenting from the beautiful Sunshine Coast, which is Gubby Gubby country. In terms of the format of the presentation, Paula is going to begin by defining and describing sepsis and discussing the problem of sepsis mortality in the paediatric population. She will then provide a brief overview of the study design and cohort. I will talk through some of the complexities involved in identifying sepsis in cause of death data, as well as the international method for identifying sepsis related deaths used in this study. I'll then share some of our findings and in particular, highlight the value of linked data in efforts to accurately identify the incidence of sepsis mortality. Please be aware that these are preliminary findings only, and so they will likely differ slightly from our final published findings. Paula will then conclude with some thoughts on the benefits of interagency partnerships in sepsis prevention efforts. I'll hand over to Paula now. Thanks, Paula. Yes, thanks, thanks, Bex, and I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. Look, the, the first couple of slides that I'm going to talk about are really just to share the, um, the awfulness of my day job, which is how important sepsis is, how devastating it is for our patients, and how difficult it is to try and prevent and treat. So first off, what is sepsis? Well, it's infection, often your common or garden types of infections like gastroenteritis or flu, and in this era of 
sort of middle of a pandemic, things like COVID, um, where the, the host response, immune response to that infection is becomes dysregulated. And as a response, as a, a result of that, we develop organ dysfunction. And when that organ dysfunction involves a cardiovascular system, it's called septic shock. Now, the importance of the escalation and the progression of the disease is that the mortality rate goes up as you as you move from normal infection into sepsis. And um, we know that for children, um, a quarter of the children that die in pediatric critical care units die from sepsis and very few children die anyway so that's an enormous number so it's an important part of our job um, as intensivists to look after septic children. Now certain things are associated with risk and those are being particularly young having pre-existing comorbidities but I do want to add here that 50% of children in Australia who have sepsis were previously well, and a third of those who die from sepsis do not have pre-existing mortality. And there are a number of other demographic, socio and economic um, uh, factors that affect the incidence of sepsis. We know that our rural and remote communities are overrepresented, and we know our indigenous, indigenous communities are overrepresented. Next slide, please, Beth. So, how big is the problem? Well, it's enormous. So this is data from 2017 from WHO who looked at estimates of um, global sepsis in 2017. 11 million people died from sepsis and 3.4 million of them were children, which equates to a child dying of sepsis around the world, one in every nine seconds. So a couple of hundred um, during, during this morning's talks. So that was enormous and um, WHO therefore made a resolution uh, inviting member countries of WHO to please prioritise um, sepsis and tackling of sepsis and Australia was an early adopter of that. And as a result of that, the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare has brought out sepsis standards in July of last year. Now part of their commissioning um, work for that involved this five-year study which, which looked at the epidemiology of sepsis and it shows it's a, still a big problem here in Australia. There are nearly um, half a million septic patients, including adults and children, within our, within our populations in hospitals over five years. And if you had sepsis versus those patients who didn't have sepsis, you were 10 times more likely to be admitted to ICU and 11 times more likely to die. Those are pretty stark statistics. Next slide, please, Beck. And paediatrics has some unique difficulties. It's pretty difficult to spot sepsis early. And childhood infection is really, really common. So how do you see the one child is going to get sepsis out of the 1,000, 1,500 children who present with cough and colds? Part of that is involving parents and public awareness. And unfortunately, when with the George Institute did surveys of Australians and their understanding of sepsis and compared it to other diseases like HIV and breast cancer, they found that in the middle of a pandemic, where we are all talking about infection and viral infection every single day, only 60% of the population had heard of sepsis. And when you narrowed that down to the population who are of parenting age, fewer than half of them had ever heard of it. And when you drill down even further, fewer than 20% even knew it was related to having an infection. And the difficulty with this is it's easy to spot late sepsis, but our ability to do anything about changing the outcome there is very small those kids have poor outcomes. Whereas if we can spot it early, we have a better chance of improving outcomes. So there is real treatment and real prevention that can happen. Next slide, please, Beth. And this is data from uh, Queensland's Quality Council, where over sort of five years, they looked at um, the reported serious critical events, um, and there were 28 of them. Now, the first, first thing to note is that very few, um, and we know that critical events are often underreported. But when we looked at these critical events, 23 of these babies or these children died, um, and the remainder had permanent um, harm that, that was a consequence of this. And when they looked at the things that had happened in the treatment of the children, the multifactorial gaps in care, and they 
related to delay in the recognition of treatment, so things like diagnostic error or not monitoring adequately. They talked about systems failure, where, for example, guidelines or policies didn't deliver, where there was inadequate escalation, where the communication was inadequate. And then there were real individual human factors related to healthcare professionals, where cognitive errors or knowledge-based errors happened. So sepsis and the treatment of sepsis, there is just it's difficult to recognize, it's difficult to get there early. We know that if you get there early, you can change the outcomes. But in doing that, there are so many layers to that process that things can go wrong and you can end up with poor outcomes. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. So I'm trying to give you a flavor that, that um, understanding sepsis mortality is multi-layered and it's nuanced. And we know that sepsis um, coding is very poor and it under-recognizes the amount of sepsis that is out there and that is particularly true when it comes to mortality and correctly identifying sepsis as part of that of, of a child's death. We know there is minimal, in fact probably no Australian national level reporting of sepsis um, incidence and mortality and we know there are no um, population-based studies of sepsis mortality in children. Those that we have are either um, hospital administration based or public hospital administration based or even worse just intensive care based because that's where we have the data. So the accurate surveillance of sepsis mortality is important for us to for a program like myself, which is tasked with reducing the burden of sepsis in, in, in our pediatric population. So if we can't survey it accurately, then how on earth am I going to track what we're doing and whether we're having any impact at all on improving outcomes from sepsis? So next slide, please, Beck. Um, and I just wanted to point out that this problem is not unique to Australia. This is this is around the world. The, the difficulties in coding for sepsis and the difficulties in understanding, um, in having sepsis recorded uh, as, a, as a cause of death is worldwide. So um, this is data from uh, the UK uh, Confidential Inquiry, Just Say Sepsis in 2015, where they took a, a sample of prospectively identified adult patients, adult patients diagnosed with sepsis. So these definitely were diagnosed with sepsis with clinicians at the time. They took a sample of 500 or so of them. and a fair number died, 159 of them died. Now that there weren't death certificates in all of them, but there were about 100 and, or 105 death certificates related to those deaths. 42 of them, which is about 25%, had sepsis mentioned on the death certificate. The rest did not. And when they reviewed those that did not have sepsis even mentioned on the death certificate, they found that actually probably 81% of them would, would have, would have been changed to add sepsis by the reviewers, which I think is significant. So this is a this is a global phenomenon around the world that we're not coding properly and we're not picking up and recording sepsis deaths properly. Um, next next slide, please, Beck. So we have, and I'm so excited by it, we have managed to do something incredible here in Queensland. We have my program, which is with the uh, Children's Health Queensland, and I'm. Um, the Queensland Paediatric Sepsis Program, we are partnering with um, the um, Family and Child Commission and we're looking at the incidence and the factors associated with child death from 2004 through to 2021. And this is a population-based study that's using hospital administrative data and death data. So we're going to build up a much more comprehensive and much more accurate um, picture. So the child death register is obviously maintained by the QFCC and it started in 2004 and we've got sort of I think over 8,000 cases in there and it's a mixture of birth registration data, coronal information and information from other government organisations um, or agencies that um, have pertinent information about that child's circumstances of the death or, or the death itself. So it's a very comprehensive um, look at the death circumstances and we managed to link that now with perinatal data, hospital admitted patient data and emergency data. So we're going to get a really rich resource which we can then mine. Next next uh, slide please Beck. Um, and so what we're looking at are all children, so birth to, to 17 years who've died from sepsis and the coding for sepsis, either those explicit codes or those implicit codes where we're including infection plus organ dysfunction. And we are excluding some, some pragmatically, some 
some cohorts and those are infants who never leave hospital who die before they've left hospital because often those include the pretermers or um, children with congenital um, anomalies etc where sepsis is really a different type of um, uh, condition in those kids. We are excluding those who are born unexpectedly at home in poor condition and we're also excluding kids who are known to be on an end of life uh, palliative pathway because there would be a ceiling of care and we know that sepsis often is the terminal event for these patients but you wouldn't necessarily be treating it in the same way so we are going to be excluding those. Next slide please. Thank you. It's actually over to you isn't it? <laughs> got to take myself off mute. Okay, so to understand some of the complexities that are involved with identifying deaths due to sepsis in cause of death data, and Paula has touched on those that we're seeing in the research literature, but it's first necessary to have a bit of a chat about how deaths are coded and reported. So in Australia and internationally, cause of death information on a death certificate, autopsy report or coronial findings is coded using the 10th revision of the International Classification of Diseases or ICD-10. And the Australian modification of ICD-10 is also used to code morbidity data from inpatient and outpatient records and emergency presentations. Now, importantly, in coding causes of death, the underlying cause of death is selected from the conditions that are reported on the death certificate. And the underlying cause is defined as the disease or the injury which initiated the train of events leading directly to death. In publications that analyse cause of death, it is the underlying cause of death that is predominantly reported. But when it comes to sepsis, this gets a little complex because even when sepsis is explicitly mentioned on the death certificate, and we know at oftentimes it is not, sepsis is rarely the underlying cause of death. This is because in most sepsis cases, the underlying cause is attributed to the underlying infection or in cases where the child had pre-existing medical complexity, it is attributed to that background chronic condition. So I've illustrated the issue here. So the graphic on the left shows the underlying, the intermediate and the immediate causes of death on a standard death certificate. And on your right, you can see that the underlying cause of death in this case would be attributed to the gastroenteritis, even though sepsis is identified on the death certificate. So this shows that standard methods for reporting mortality statistics, that is by underlying cause of death, will absolutely not accurately identify many sepsis cases. So in the Queensland Paediatric Sepsis Mortality Study that we're undertaking, even when it was explicitly identified on the death certificate, sepsis was coded as the underlying cause of death in only approximately a quarter of the cases. So a related problem that Paula has already alluded to is that while sepsis may not be explicitly documented on the death certificate, both the acute infection and the consequential organ dysfunction may be. So if we recall, sepsis is defined as new organ dysfunction due to an acute infection. So in cases such as the one shown on the slide, sepsis is implied because of the by the combination of the infection, in this case the rotavirus, and the organ dysfunction, in this case the acidosis and cardiac arrest. So again, the standard underlying cause of death approach to analysing and reporting on causes of death will simply not identify these cases as sepsis. To accurately quantify the incidence of sepsis deaths, all cases in which sepsis is either explicitly documented on the death certificate or cases where sepsis is implied through the presence of an underlying infection and consequential organ dysfunction should be identified. And this requires multiple cause of death analysis using the underlying, intermediate and immediate causes of death. So I'll just take you through the internationally accepted method for identifying sepsis in cause of death and hospital admission data. And this has been used in most epidemiological studies of sepsis since the early 2000s. And what they do is they classify sepsis into two mutually exclusive groups, explicit sepsis and implied sepsis. 
So the table that we've popped up on the slide shows this international method, and it also shows our modification of the method that we are using in the paediatric sepsis mortality study. So broadly speaking, what we've done is we've expanded the inclusion criteria to overcome some known limitations in both cause of death certification and in the coding of sepsis and infections. So according to the international method, the identification of explicit sepsis requires that an ICD-10 code referencing sepsis is included as the underlying or a chain cause of death. In our method, we also included cases where a text search of the uncoded death certificate identified the term sepsis, but an ICD code referencing sepsis had not been included. And sometimes that is not included due to the intricacies of coding rules. As we linked hospital admission data for the final admission during which a child died, cases were also classified as explicit sepsis if an ICD-10 code referencing sepsis was included as a principal or other diagnosis. When we turn to implied sepsis, using the international method, cases classified as implied are identified by an ICD-10 infection code listed as the underlying cause of death and an organ dysfunction code listed as a chain cause. We expanded this to include cases where the infection was listed as an underlying or a chain cause. And the reason we did that is to pick up on those cases where the underlying cause has been attributed to the complex comorbid condition. We also included cases where a text search of death certificate data revealed the term multiple organ, dis organ failure, as there is um, no specific corresponding code for this in ICD-10. So in terms of our study, what we did is we began our sepsis screening by identifying all children who had an infection code listed as either the underlying or a chain or a contributing cause of death. And this ensured that we included all child deaths where infection played a contributory role and therefore sepsis was at least possible. There were, 100, there were 12, sorry, 1,204 child deaths where infection played a causal or contributory contributory role in the death. We then used, we then excluded, sorry, those infants who had died in hospital having never left after birth as well as those children known to be on a palliative pathway at the time of diagnosis. We then used multiple cause of death and linked hospital admission data to categorise the deaths. So of the 712 infection-related deaths after exclusions, there are 299 cases of explicit sepsis and 128 cases of implied sepsis. And then we have those 285 non-sepsis infection-related deaths remaining. Importantly, in 203 of the included cases, the death occurred in the home environment or very shortly after presentation to an emergency department and the remaining incurred in hospital. So linked hospital admission data was available for 437 of the in-hospital deaths. And our data linkage there was affected by the age of the records. And that's because private hospital admissions data was not available prior to 2007. So looking here, I want to show you the immense value that we see in linking cause of death data from the child death register with hospital admissions data in increasing the identification of in-hospital deaths due to sepsis. So sepsis was explicitly recorded on the death certificate in 159 in-hospital deaths. However, when we linked that hospital admissions data, it increased the number of explicit sepsis cases by nearly 50% from 159 to 237 deaths. And similarly, due to the increased identification of organ dysfunction in hospital admission data, the number of implied sepsis cases increased by nearly 30% from 85 to 110 cases. And this obviously meant that the remaining non-sepsis infection deaths decreased substantially by nearly 53%. 
So data linkage is not only valuable in increasing the identification of in-hospital deaths due to sepsis, but as we've previously mentioned, 203 deaths, nearly 30%, occurred out of hospital, in the home environment, or en route or very shortly after presentation to an emergency department. These deaths are always missed in hospital admissions data and are missing from the vast majority of paediatric sepsis studies, which have relied solely on those health data sets. Data linkage studies are therefore really invaluable in piecing together the puzzle of paediatric sepsis. So I'll now hand back to Paula to conclude with some remarks about the value of interagency partnerships in sepsis prevention. Thanks, Beck. Um, I mean, I think we are incredibly excited by this partnership because we know um, that sepsis is eminently treatable and poor outcomes are eminently preventable. And that is a core piece of business for agencies such as the QFCC and, and others who will be um, from other jurisdictions who will be listening as part of this conference. I think really exciting for me is first off, we have actually established methods to um, correctly identify these patients from hospital and death records and that um, method is scalable across the country so we could actually get really impressive um, comprehensive picture from throughout Australia and New Zealand and, and that to me is extraordinarily exciting and next up is we could probably be doing this this is paving the way for a whole lot of future research understanding the importance of the demographic and socioeconomic factors um, that, that affect paediatric sepsis and we'll be able to do those deep dives um, in, the, in the future. But the key thing for, for me and, and my program is that 30% of what we thought is 30% of cases are completely invisible that we've never been able to access, influence, know about. And now suddenly we have a whole 30% more of um, cases that we can try to understand to piece together the puzzle, as, as Beck says, of sepsis. So working together with agencies like the QFCC and ourselves, we are able to um, build and, and, and increase our sphere of influence into areas where we can't normally influence at all. So together we are actually building a much bigger, more comprehensive picture and we will be able therefore with our scope in terms of um, reducing the burden of paediatric sepsis, we'll be able to influence a whole lot of areas which we couldn't do before. So the partnership together is incredibly exciting and I do hope that um, as an example, this would be the first of many for, for, for the QFCC and, and for ourselves. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you.